Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin. Hopefully you viewed the introductory video to Chapter 9 of Men's Textbook. In this video, I want to introduce you to intentional torts, so chapter torts, intentional, negligence, strict liability torts. Intentional torts are where someone intends an act that causes harm. So let's take the intentional tort of defamation. Here these bullet points are actually the elements that must be proved in order to support a cause of action for defamation. You need a defamatory statement, a statement that is untrue. It needs to be communicated to a third party or disseminated, whatever word you want to use. That could be spoken, text, printed, email, video. Just need a third party to receive that communication. There needs to be specificity and there was harm or damages. So we can't all defame one another when we say bad things about one another because sometimes there's no harm. There needs to be a statement that causes harm. Defenses to defamation. For example, if you are telling the truth, then that's a complete and absolute defense to defamation. If all you have said is the truth, however harmful that is, there is no right to a cause of action for defamation when stating a truthful statement. Also, there are privileges where there are situations where people can say defamatory things and not be sued for them. And we have a unique situation where public figures, the intentional tort has a slightly higher standard. Rather than simply saying the defamatory statement, it needs to be said with malice or reckless disregard for the truth because public figures are in the public and things will be said about them. And candidate for public offices or celebrities, people that we know need to anticipate that things will be said about them. So the slightly higher standard that it for an intentional tort of defamation against a public figure. You need to really have malice or wrongful, bad intent or reckless disregard for the truth. So there are what we call privilege defenses and we use the word privilege to describe a situation where Someone has actually the ability to say things and not be afraid of being sued for defamation. It's not so much that, well, I say this, but I kind of chuckle. It's not so much that we encourage these officials to defame one another or say untruths, but it's more an understanding that uh, in legislative bodies, in judicial proceedings, you must be able, according to U.S. law, to speak freely without feeling the threat of um, defamation. So if you are in those absolute privileged situations, you can say things without fear of being sued for defamation. However, Qualified privileges exist for the media and employers, and there may be some protection, but it's not absolute. With respect to businesses, defamation has a, another name, it's disparagement, and it occurs when a business is spoken poorly of or disparaged or product is spoken poorly of or disparaged and the speaker 
knew the statement was false or had reckless disregard for the truth, didn't bother to see if it was true, and it was communicated to a third party. And there are some jurisdictions where there are protections for certain industries against product disparagement. Another intentional tort is fraudulent misrepresentation. We talked a little bit about misrepresentation when we talked about contracts. Um, this is a this is different this and, and very similar uh, under tort law we allow recovery where a material fact was misrepresented by a tortfeasor it's possible the tortfeasor knew the material fact was false or had dis reckless disregard for the truth and the tortfeasor must have intended an innocent party to rely on the statements, presumably to act on it, to buy something, for instance. And then damages were suffered by the innocent party. So here you're selling a yacht and you tell the buyer, not that I've ever bought a yacht, but it's a big, big, boat that's supposed to float in the water and you tell the buyer it does but you are the seller and you know that it will sink and you say all these false things and the buyer buys the yacht and the boat sinks and there nobody was harmed but there was economic harm and that's another intentional tort a intentional tort that if I were in the classroom I love to talk about false imprisonment, detaining somebody for an appreciable amount of time. This ha does happen with suspected shoplifters, but when in the classroom I love to ask students how long would it take before I release you from the classroom before you would have a claim against me for false imprisonment. How much after class would I need to detain you to be accused of tortious false imprisonment as, a, as opposed to criminal? And for the answer to that, you'll have to take my class when it's not online. See you in the next video.